you're almost a person who doesn't need an introduction, but of course I'm gonna give him a quick one anyway. Um, Stuart is one of the most eminent and accomplished ecologists in the world today, hands down. Um, he was educated at Oxford. He did his PhD, I think with John Weens in New Mexico, is that right? One of the, the eminent bird ecologists, John, uh -huh, in, and John in, Weens? In New Mexico, but not with John Weens. Okay, all right. Um, Stuart has worked in many different parts of the world, many endangered parts of the world. Uh, these would include places like the Amazon, Latin America. He's done a lot of work in Africa. He's obviously continuing his work there now. Stuart and I know each other well through, partly through something called the Biological Dynamics of Force Fragments Project, which of course is the famous uh, fragmentation study in the Amazon. Stuart's been very heavily involved with that, and so have I and Susan Lawrence uh, there for a number of years. So anyway, we our paths uh, cross relatively frequently, and Stuart almost always has something new and interesting to say. So without further ado, we'll turn it over to Stuart to talk about the 3030 proposed solution for the Earth. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me. Um, I love your part of the world. I've visited it many times, um, and, and it's a real honor to talk, uh, talk with you. Um, the 30% solution. And the origin of this is the um, meeting of uh, the uh, Conference of the Parties of the uh, Convention on Biological Diversity, which was held finally in uh, in Canada in, in 2022. It was supposed to have started in Kunming in China. China was a co-host. Um, and I want to look at a number of questions that, that arise from from this conference. Um, what are its aspirations? What have we done up to now? Um, are we meeting the, the various targets? And, and what can we do to, to do things better? So the previous major COP in 2010 came up with a set of targets that said, we want to protect 17% um, of the world by 2020. You might say, why 17%? It has no uh, justification whatsoever. It's just that they thought they could do it. And the reality was that they didn't. Um, they came close. And then literally at the last minute, within the last few months, they decided that you know they, they could get to 17% if they fudged a little bit. They could add in a bunch of places around the world where nobody lives, and they can say, aha, these are protected. Well, 30% is not the only target. Um, the late Ed Wilson, who was a very dear friend of mine, uh, wrote a very passionate uh, book called Half Earth, when he said, look, we've got to protect half. And you know, those are wonderful statements. Um, and it's really up to us, you know, the conservation community, to, to ensure that we hold the politicians' feet to the fire um, and that they do this and they do that in a sensible way. And for that, you need, you need some good science. So at COP15, a hundred or more countries said, yes, great idea, we're, gonna, we're, going, to, we're going to protect 30%. Um, uh, the uh, U.S. said, yep, yeah, we like it. Biden likes it. We're going to protect 30%. Um, your government said, yeah, absolutely, we love it. Um, we're going to have zero new extinctions. I'm not sure you, how you can have an old extinction. Uh, you can you have an extinction twice. But nonetheless, here's your environment minister saying all sorts of wonderful things um, about how they were going to protect 30% of Oz's land and sea by 2030. Um, here is one of the innumerable number of people who have been Prime Minister of Great Britain. Um, and, um, the, you know, what can I say? He wants to, uh, he wants to protect 400,000 hectares of English countryside. I'm not sure where he's going to find 400,000 hectares of English countryside. But there he is with his hair nicely combed during the very, very short time that he was one of Britain's innumerable prime ministers. Look, 
30% is a great idea. But there are clearly some places where 30% is not going to be enough. Um, I am not a fan of tipping points. I think Rockstrom's work is a total farce. Uh, but there are clearly some places where tipping points are very real and a very significant threat. And you can find out about those tipping points by reading sensible publications like the IPCC. And it notes that there are probably two ones, two tipping points for which we have fairly good evidence. Uh, the familiar one is in the Arctic. Um, the, the more biodiversity relevant one is in the Amazon, where um, we know that as you chop the forest down, the Amazon becomes drier. As it becomes drier, it becomes more flammable. That makes it drier still. And you get this positive feedback. The, the very important paper that the late Tom Lovejoy uh, wrote with Carlos Nobre a few years ago says, look, you know, if we don't protect 70 or 80 percent of the Amazon, we're going to be in deep trouble. So as we talk about 30 percent, please understand there are some places where we've got to protect a lot more. So one way to look at, think about what we do next is to say, well, you know, what what have we done in the past? What uh, uh, what did we achieve uh, from twenty twenty to um, uh, sorry from twenty ten to twenty twenty? The uh, United Nations um, uh, a, a decade on biodiversity. What what did we do? Well, first of all, look at the look at the targets. The the targets that were posited in in twenty ten were to protect seventeen percent of of the land. Um, and so that's a, a fairly clear target. But how well are we meeting biodiversity targets? Well, in 2019, a group of very wise people came out with, and I need a deep breath to say this, the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. <sighs> it best, for sure. And it says, look, you know, there's a lot of bad things going on with biodiversity, and we need to do something about that. Um, I am hugely relieved that Ibbes did not talk about the sixth extinction. It's a great term. It's um, kind of hard to nail down. And there's a lot of that about. There's a lot of claims about how, you know, we're all going to hell. Uh, but it doesn't really help in terms of shaping the science you know, or, for that matter, shaping the policy. So one of the things that Ibbes said um, was that there are 8 million species on the planet. Now, for, for those of you who are students, young and impressionable, keen to make a, a mark on the world, a piece of advice that there are wonderful and thoughtful reports that come out from agencies. And then there are the executive summaries. It's quite often that those who write the executive summaries will not know a species if it bit them on the ass, and they certainly don't have much of an idea about the science. Those who write headlines and those who write summaries are not usually you know, the boffins in the back room. So that said, it's often these sort of headlines that capture people's imagination. And one of them was this idea that there are 8 million species. Oh, I love that. 8 million, you know, 8.0. Isn't that fantastic? Um, and tens of hundreds of times extinction rate, that's okay. And then up to a million species threatened with extinctions. That's a complete joke. It comes from taking 20 or 30 percent of species that are endangered with extinction and multiplying 20 or 30 percent by 8 million and coming up with 1 million. And you think, oh, let me get my calculator out. Oh, that's not the right answer. In any case, estimates of how many species there are. Um, 
are very, very sketchy. The extinction rate, in contrast, we can estimate. So, 20 odd years ago, my colleagues and I decided that we needed to have a better estimate of what the damage is that we're doing to the planet. And we came up with an extinction rate, which I'm going to define. And the extinction rate we claimed is a thousand times higher than it should be. And, and Al Gore in his Inconvenient Truth talks about you know, this, this, this statistic. If you wonder where Al Gore got it from, you got it from me. Um, having said that, you know, any fool can be, no, maybe not any fool. You know, lots of people get quoted by the media and politicians and the rest of them. But I'm enormously proud of the fact that my work has appeared in a street demonstration. Not many scientists can say my work was the subject of a placard held up in, 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 in a demonstration. And here it is, extinction rate up a thousandfold. I was enormously chuffed about that. And for many, many years, I gave this talk and said, I would like to know who this young lady is holding up this placard. Um, and, uh, and a year ago, I found out and I met her and I bought her a very nice bottle of wine. So there's Heather Aykroyd promoting my work in a demonstration. Wow. So why do we need to have this notion of extinction rate? Well, a few years ago, Bill and I and a couple of other people, led by uh, Brett Sheffers, decided we ought to look at what we know about how many species there are. Um, why do we need to talk about extinction rate? Why can't we just talk about how many species are going extinct per day? Um, and the simple reality is um, that we can't talk about how many species are going extinct per day or how many species are going extinct, you know, like the, this surprisingly round number of one million. Because, frankly, we don't have a good idea of how many species there are. Um, there are some taxonomic groups that we've got a good idea for. Uh, birds, mammals, amphibians, plants now, um, reptiles, few marine taxa. Um, but by and large, we, we don't have any clue. And that's because we just simply don't have credible estimates of, of how many species of insect there are. Uh, we don't know how many species of fungi there are. So, so to come up with a number of one million, you're just pulling it out of the air or a rather more rudely, a smellier place. So the danger of coming up with an estimate of you know, a million species going extinct or 100,000 species going extinct per year is that politicians are going to come up to you and say, okay, you know, if, if a million species are going extinct, name them. You know, can you give me a list of those species? And we can't. N not a list that has a million species on it. Um, we can't come up with a list of species that go extinct every year, even though they could be, could be thousands of them. And the inability to come up with that number makes us look suspect in the eyes of people who want to deny that there is an extinction crisis. So we want to have numbers that we can, we can defend, we can justify. So while we can um, estimate the, the number of missing species of plants and some other taxa, probably about 15% of plants are missing from the record. We can estimate that from the rate at which species are being described. That rate per taxonomist is declining. And you can calculate how long it's going to be before taxonomists are going to be out of work. Um, for some taxa, we can do that. For most, we can't. 
So 8 million is just one of several very controversial estimates. But we can calculate death rates, can calculate rates of, 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 of mortality. And I want to draw an analogy for, um, for, for human death rate, death rates of individuals. Mm -hmm. So in a typical year in the United States, 8,100 people per million people die each year. During COVID, um, it was substantially higher than that, came out with a uh, higher estimate of, of death rate. And incidentally, you can, you can dissect this in a lot of ways and find out which groups of people had higher death rates than others. Republicans had a higher death rate than Democrats which some of us would like to think is a solution, even though a brutally unkind one. So let's do that for, for species. So if we look at birds, amphibians, and mammals, um, we can calculate a death rate. How do we do that? Well, by the year 1900, um, the number of species of birds that have been described since the time of Linnaeus was a little shy of 9,000. And out of that 9,000 species, 93 had become extinct. We do the same thing for amphibians, the same thing for, for, for mammals. So you've taken the cohort, approximately 9,000 species, um, and you've looked at how many have died. And you might think if there were 9,000 species and 93 extinctions, why is the extinction rate only 51? Well, the reality is that not all of those 9,000 species were known in the year 1800. So you take the number of years a species has been known. Turns out that, that half of bird species were known by about 1850. So knowing this cohort of species and when they were described and when they became extinct, you can calculate an extinction rate. And for birds that were known before 1900, it's 51 extinctions per million species per year. Um, if you do that for species described after 1900, um, it's almost three times higher. The reason for that is that species that were known to, uh, to Linnaeus have wide geographical distributions by and large. Um, species that were described more recently um, have very narrow distributions. They're hard to find. That's why we've only just described them. So more recently described species higher, higher extinction rates. And this is true of plants. It's a wonderful study done by colleagues at Kew Gardens that have done this for plants. The one thing we know about plants is the taxonomic catalog is still incomplete. We estimate that about 15 species are missing, 15% of species are missing. Um, and so the extinction rates of plants are lower, but again, you get the same pattern of the recently described species having higher extinction rates. So we now have, we now have metrics. We now have an estimate of how much damage we're doing to biodiversity. Um, and incidentally, there are studies, including those done by Stuart Buchart and his team at Cambridge, that look at the, the impact of conservation on reducing those rates. How do we compare this to what we would expect, the background rates? Well, you might think we compare it to the fossil record. Um, the fossil record is... Um, is very, very difficult to interpret. It's such a different scale, it's a different resolution. 
Um, so it, it's sort of hard to make this comparison. It's why I don't like the idea of a sixth extinction. It, it really isn't a credible comparison. We know we're driving species to extinction rapidly, but but the uh, you know the notion that you can compare it to what happened at you know sixty million years ago is a stretch. Um, we can look at um, birth rates, how fast species diversify. Uh, and then we can do some very, very clever and difficult and fancy statistics on molecular phylogenies, and I don't have time to talk about those. But I can talk about diversification rates. And here's the basic idea. This is a lineage of, of orchids. It's a group of um, South African orchids. Um, Southern African orchids. Um, and you create the phylogeny. And these phylogenies are very familiar. It's quite likely that there are people in the audience today who are producing phylogenies like this for, the, for their groups. So we have thousands of phylogenies that people have developed in different groups over the years. And you can look at the rate at which they expand. Uh, it's a birth rate. And the birth rate of species is about 0.26 new species per million species per year. Same units as death rate. So we've got a death rate that's on the order of somewhere between 100 and 1,000 extinctions per million species per year. And we've got a birth rate, which is about 0.1 new species per million species per year. So it's these comparisons that um, allow us to make justified estimates of, of, of how bad things are, and also about how effective conservation actions are. Conservation actions are reducing the extinction rate by um, something on the order of 25 to 30 percent. So we've got measures that we can justify. We have the names of the species that have gone extinct. These, these are credible estimates that we can uh, we can share the policymakers. So, what are we doing to prevent extinctions? Well, the obvious solution is to protect more of the planet. The, the first line of defense is to set up uh, protected areas. Um, this is a map that shows in green uh, the world's protected areas. And then it's on a map of, of the, the human impact on the planet, it comes out of the Brisbane group. Um, and immediately you see that protected areas tend to be in places where there are a few people. They're in what we call wild areas, wilderness. And I follow Ed Wilson's definition of wilderness. It's not that there aren't any people there, but there are people living lightly on the landscape. And if you look at the Venn diagram, where we've done our best to separate the planet into two halves, the half uh, that has high in human impact and the half that has lower human impact. Um, you can see that most of the green areas, most of the protected areas are in places where there are few people. So um, the challenge is if we ask the political leadership to protect 30% or 50%, um, where are they going to put those protected areas? And the answer is pretty obvious. They're going to put them in these remote places because that's what they've been doing already. And the question then is, should we get more of those places? Well, here's, um, I believe, the world's largest national park. Um, it's a place I've seen. That photograph is mine. Um, and the reason I've seen it is I was sitting in a very comfortable seat at 40,000 feet, uh, 10,000 meters, um, flying from, from Detroit to, to Beijing. And on a clear day, if you fly from uh, from Detroit to Beijing, you go right over the pole. You go due north, due north until you get to the pole, and then you go down to the side. Um, and um, I'm sure it's a marvelous place. Um, I'm 
sure it's uh, it's a wonderful place to see musk ox and polar bears neither of which i've seen but it isn't exactly dripping in species um and so there are you know big protected areas that that however spectacular their scenery may be they're not contributing a great deal to biodiversity in the middle of the Te Tibetan plateau, there's a, a, a fantastic reserve called Sangjiang Wan, the Three Rivers. It's where the Mekong, the Yangtze, um, and the Yellow River uh, uh, arise. We're in a very short area, short area. In a day, you can see the headwaters of those three big rivers. Um, that's China's biggest protected area. And, and then in Australia, you know, what, what you call miles and miles of bloody Australia, has bloody big protected areas in it, and and they are interesting and wonderful places, but they're not exactly dripping in species in the way that the you know the the rainforests of Queensland do. So we know we're putting protected areas in places that have few species. So let's look. Having said that, at whether protected areas are doing a better or a worse job of protecting biodiversity than we would expect. So I've simplified this Venn diagram to say 50% of the land is wilderness, 50% is human dominated, 13% of the land is protected. Um, and given that, what should we expect um, the fraction of species to be protected? So let's take a, an insect. Let's take a hypothetical insect that has a huge geographical range. And we're going to put this widespread species down at random on the planet we'd expect 50% of its range to be in human dominated areas, 50% in wilderness, and 13% and protected. Um, so that's a that's the statistical expectation for species that have large ranges. What happens when you have species with small ranges? So this is a group of species at yet, as yet, undiscovered, these are the unicorns, and there we are. There are six putative species of unicorn, and they have tiny geographical ranges, which is why we haven't found them yet. If you imagine what happens to species with small ranges, as a group, you'd expect 50% in wilderness, 50% not in wilderness, 13% in in protected areas. So it's the same expectation, but it's for the for the group of species as a whole. Individual species would not be like that, but collectively, species with small ranges should still have the same statistics. So now let's look at what happens. If we look at birds and mammals and amphibians around the planet, um, we find that for species with large geographical ranges, meaning more than a million square kilometers. We find that, yeah, about 13% of them, are, are, of their ranges are protected. And close to 50% of their ranges are in wilderness. So species with large geographical ranges are protected about as good as we would expect. I mean, you probably gathered it really can't be any other way. If you've got a really big range, it has to reflect the average for the planet. The more interesting question is what happens when we look at species with tiny geographical ranges. And the remarkable pattern that my colleagues and I found is that we have done very, very much better at protecting the most vulnerable species, the ones that with very, very small ranges, than we would expect. That uh, we've often protected up to 50% of, of their ranges, typically at least 25% of their ranges, for, with the protected areas that we have. So, hey, good for us. We have put protected areas in the right places. 
Now, that might be a contrast. It means that we're putting small protected areas in the right places, not necessarily big ones, but we're definitely allocating protection in a non-random way to benefit the most vulnerable species. The issue, of course, as you can see, is that even if we were to expand protected areas to the 50% of the planet that is wilderness, it wouldn't do very much good. It would protect a few more species on average, but not a lot more. In other words, it's not how much area you protect, but the quality of the area that you protect. It's quality, not quantity. Um, uh, my colleague, uh, uh, Professor Bin Lee, and I have, have done this for China. Um, we've done it for China because China's um, protected area system only began to develop in the 1980s. Um, and we wanted to provide guidance for uh, for China for, for, for the COP15, which it was hosting. Um, and it's the same story. Uh, China has created a lot of very big national parks. But it's also put smaller protected areas pretty much in the right place to disproportionately protect uh, the, the more vulnerable species. So look around. We should pat ourselves on the back. We've, we've done a much better job than, than you might think. Um, that um, This is a sample of, uh, of, of species that are are protected by dedicated uh, reserves. The uh, the hummingbird and the poison dart frog are in a in a reserve that's uh, created by the work we do at Saving Nature. Um, so that even private nature reserves can can make a difference. So we have done a lot better, but it means that we have to continue to do better, and not just merely be seduced by large targets. You know, 30% is great, but it better be 30% in the right place. Um, we can do the wrong things. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but, but this is a study we did for the United States, where we looked at the, the distribution of, of endemic species of mammals and birds and amphibians and reptiles and fish and trees. And you can see there's a huge concentration of uh, um, of a species in the southeast, the the Appalachians, the lowlands of the southeast southeast United States, and including where I live in North Carolina, these are the biodiversity hotspots. Out in the west, we have huge national parks, uh, but that's by and large not where the endemic species are. Um, those blue dots on the bottom graph. Uh, are land trusts, privately funded small nature reserves. And um, if we look at that in detail for, for the East, again, you can contrast where the endemic areas are, where the distribution of the um, uh, of these private nature reserves are. Um, and most of these private nature reserves are funded by the world's largest conservation group, they tell us, called the Nature Conservancy. Um, and if you look at where the Nature Conservancy puts its properties, it's not where the species are, um, um, but where uh, but where rich people live. But the map on the right is where, where rich people live in the US. Um, now, uh, my friend Hugh Possingham, who I'm sure many of you know, um, Hugh thinks that this is an efficient way of doing conservation, and I profoundly disagree. Um, I, I think we have to be very careful because, uh, yeah, spending a billion dollars on conservation, which is what TNC does, isn't going to work if you put the reserves in the wrong place. So, you know, TNC spends an awful lot of money on Connecticut. I have nothing against Connecticut. I'm sure there are very nice people in Connecticut. In fact, I know very nice people in Connecticut. On the other hand, that's not where the biodiversity is. 
So I think we have to be very careful how how we allocate where protection is. It's easy to get the wrong answer. So how does this match with, with Ed? Um, and, you know, Ed has made this, this plea for half of us. Um, and um, Ed and I have had many, many forthright discussions over the year, and I cherish a particular email I got from him uh, six years ago now. Uh, where it says, look, yeah, I think half Earth is a good idea. It's a powerful conception. We shouldn't abandon it. I agree. Half Earth was very much the stimulus for what COP15 was going to do. But equally, it, it, we've got to get the priorities. We need to have a prioritized half Earth. All right, so how can we do better? Well, we need to do a couple of things better than we've done in the past. One of them is we need to know where speeds are. We need to have better maps so we can set priorities. Most of the priority setting exercises assume that you know we know where the species are. Well, there's two huge changes that have occurred within the last, certainly within the last decade. One of them is that we now have uh, fantastic data sources from crowdsourcing. We have eBird, which has more than a billion observations. We have iNaturalist, the organization that uh, Scott Lowry conceived when he was one of my graduate students, um, so that we can go out and sample other things besides birds. You know, in a good month, iNaturalist gets um, a million observations. But then we have to, we have to come up with of better maps. And, and, and I think the state of the art is this work that we've done, which now brings together um, a lot of different groups. It brings together IUCN, it brings together my group, it brings together uh, um, uh, 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 practitioners such as the American Bird Conservancy and eBird. We're, we're now in a position to, uh, to bring these different um, sources of information together and come up with a better idea of, of where species are. I don't have time to talk about that. But what I do have time to talk about is, is the very obvious fact of what the world looks like. The map at the top is, is of coastal Brazil, the city of Rio de Janeiro is just off to the, to the west. Uh, the map at the bottom is Southern Africa. It's an area uh, a, a larger than us on that map, about well, maybe about the same size as Australia. And, and the forested areas at the top, protected areas at the bottom, are um, fragments. Uh, this should come as no surprise. I just pulled this off the web. Uh, this is the area just to the south of you in Cairns. Um, and you can see that what has been left of the uh, of the original forest is now a mixture of, of big protected areas and and lots and lots of small fragments. So just asking for more more area protected isn't always going to work. What we've got left is, a lot of small areas, a lot of fragments. And you know what? We know a lot about fragments. Now I'm going to play a video and you should hear the you should hear the sound. And if you don't, please uh, ping me. We can map out the distribution of many species now in considerable detail. These are birds, and they show that the warm, wet tropics are where most of the species are. Mammals show a broadly similar pattern. These are the places with the greatest concentration of species, and it's likely to be true for most species. Amphibians, for example, show a similar pattern. And while we have less detailed data for plants, it's almost certainly true for them too. Just looking at species is not sufficient. We need to dig deeper. 
Let's look again at the distribution of bird species. In the Amazon, there are the greatest numbers of species. But if we look at where species have smaller than the median range size, those distinctions are profoundly different. They concentrate in Central America and in the Northern Andes, and in places like the coastal forests of Brazil. That's important because species with small ranges are much more vulnerable to extinction than species with large ranges. So to take Brazil as a case history, if we look at the distribution of threatened species, of species with small ranges and the maps tend to be very similar, um, we can see that the, the front line for, for conservation um, is uh, these, uh, these, these coastal forests. Um, and we can begin to see the problem. If we look at the satellite imagery, this is um, uh, three Landsat images stacked side to side. It's about uh, 600 kilometers east to west on this curve. If we look at that, we see a lot of it is not green. A lot of it has lost its forest. Let's look at one area in detail. Um, there we have color coded the, the forest in this rather lurid green to make it stand out. And when you look at that, you see how much of the forest is in, is in little pieces. If we take away the pieces that are less than um, a kilometer square, you get the impression that there's a very substantial amount of the forest there uh, that's in fragments more than one, uh, one square kilometer. So it's not enough to say, okay, we've protected 15%, 20% of the forest. It's what fraction of the forest has been left in functional pieces. That's what it looks like from a helicopter. You get the idea, lots and lots of isolated forest patches. And uh, when you map out where the species are likely to be, when you take species distributions and you drape them over uh, a 3D rendering of the landscape, you see that the upland areas have few species but are fairly well protected. But the areas with the greatest number of threatened species are in the few remaining lowland patches that are about 100 kilometers um, west or east of the city of Rio de Janeiro. Um, and those areas are isolated fragments, including nature reserves that are isolated fragments. And we know from the work that Tom Lovejoy instigated um, in the Amazon work that uh, Bill uh, ran for many years and where I've been associated, um, is we have a good idea of what happens to species in fragments. Tom's vision was to create a series of fragments of different sizes, and then to follow how the species dropped out of those fragments over time. Basic idea is, Smaller fragments have uh, more extinctions and they lose their extinctions faster than larger fragments. And combining that with work that um, Tom Brooks and I did in, um, in, in Africa, we can come up with a, uh, a, a scaling relationship that says, we need to have fragments on the order of 100 square kilometers, 10,000 hectares, if we're going to slow the rate of species losses. That's a very, very practical piece of conservation science. We identify the places where the greatest number of species are at risk of extinction. And when we do that, we often find they're in very fragmented landscapes. 
they're not in large areas of continuous forests like the Amazon, but they're in the biodiversity hotspots, and those places have already lost a lot of their habitats. A good example of this is in the forest to the east of the city of Rio de Janeiro in coastal Brazil. This map shows the, the fragments and the number of threatened species that they contain. We have not just merely destroyed so much of the world's tropical forests. What we have left behind is in tatters, in fragments. And those fragments are often too small for species to maintain viable populations. There just aren't enough males to go around for the females and females to go around for the males. And of all the places, of all the fragments, one that I thought was particularly tragic was the one immediately behind me. This is the Union Biological Reserve in coastal Brazil, about 100 miles east of the city of Rio de Janeiro. Because in this isolated patch of forest are a whole load of species on the brink of extinction, the most charismatic of which is a beautiful little monkey called the golden lion tamarind. And the golden lion tamarinds in that fragment could not go forth and multiply into the forest over there because there was the cattle pasture behind me. And when I saw that cattle pasture for the first time about eight years ago, a cattle pasture, just like the one I'm standing in, I thought, it has to go. And so, we have made it go away. This is a restored forest. I helped raise money for my friends at the Asociação Mico Leão Dourado, the Golden Lion Tamarind Association. I've planted this forest and it now connects that once isolated fragment of forest in the Union Biological Reserve to a much larger area of forest over in this direction. It's what we call a biological corridor. And it means that the golden line tamarinds that were once imprisoned in this forest island, this forest fragment behind me, can now cross through these small but growing trees and go and find new habitats, new homes, new places for their, for their tamarind families. So this is what the area looked like um, um, 15 years ago, a very badly degraded uh, hillside uh, with uh, a, a very poor, a poor pasture. Um, we uh, acquired the land. Uh, pass that land on to our, our colleagues. Um, this is what it looked like after about four years. Uh, this is what it looked like about five years ago. Um, we have created a very effective biological corridor. Um, we are now doing corridors um, uh, all over the place. This is a, I'm going to go back and show that again. Um, the, so I hope I'm going to do, there we go. Uh, this was another reserve called Posa dos Santos. It was isolated by a road uh, from forest to, to the north. Um, and so we needed to both get the land and create a land bridge. Um, and so the effort there uh, was, to, uh, was to create a, a corridor uh, by, by getting the road company to build a bridge and, and then to reforest the area north of the road. I'm going to skip because I'm a bit short of time. We, we've got now um, a, about a dozen projects around the world in, in Brazil and Colombia, Ecuador, Peru and India, Tanzania, Sumatra. Um, so in summary, 30% is a great idea. We need to realize that it's neither necessary nor sufficient. It's not going to be sufficient for many landscapes, and the Amazon is an obvious one. Um, 
we don't particularly need 30% if we put our protected areas in the right places. They're not in the right places in a general sense, uh, but by being careful, we've managed to do a lot better than we expect. The challenge is to say, look, it's not 30%, it's the right 30%. We've got to get the details right. And, and we mustn't forget the details. Um, there's a lot of things that we can do at a small scale. That the, There are going to be challenges of protecting more of Australia. Um, we just don't want to protect, uh, you know, huge chunks of sparsely populated areas if they don't have a lot of species in them. Uh, we would rather, you know, go to the effort of protecting the biodiversity rich places, which are almost certainly fragmented. And the challenge is not so much to buy huge tracts of land, but to make sure that what we left behind, those fragments, are, are functional for biodiversity. So with that, um, thank you very much. Line so 22 now. Anybody online want to ask a question? While you guys are thinking about that, we'll see if anybody here wants to ask a question. Sue, no? Oh, all right. Yeah. I can see a couple of hands up. Yeah, hi. My name's uh, Fiona Ryan. I basically <sighs> do research. Can you hear me? Yeah, you can you hear me now? I, I do research basically, I'm looking at, um, for a long time I've been looking at um, carbon funding for forests and that obviously from mm. what you're saying, it doesn't always match with where the biodiversity is. Um, but also I've seen that uh, restoration generally reported by the IPCC is a lot more expensive than um, preserving forests. Um, the opportunity cost of not converting it to something else. Um, where was I going? Yeah, so I'm just wondering how you feel about those sort of conflicting things. I mean, I noticed the IUCN and also in the CBD COP doesn't mention forests and you're saying that the biodiversity is in the wet um, tropical areas, wet warm areas. Uh, and I have... I, and, Maybe there's two questions there. The second one is, is there a move just to talk about ecosystems in general and not to talk about the areas where the forests are in particular? You have to excuse me just for a second. I have somebody at the door who I was not expecting and I need to let her in, except I can't let her in. She's going to have to get in on her own. I'm sorry about that. Um, so um, I talked about forests as if it's forests and other places. There are other... There are other areas, there are other habitats, um, and, and this is particularly obvious in Australia where you've got... Um... Hi, come on in. Um, how are you? Um, where, you know, in the southwest, you've got this incredibly rich Mediterranean landscape. Not a forest, but in any other definition of the word. So I don't want you to think it's just a matter of protecting forests. But forests are important. I mean, two thirds of, of all biodiversity, two thirds of all species are in forests. So we do have to we do have to pay a lot of attention to forests, um, and we do need to be cautious when um, when politicians give us big chunks of land that are other kinds of habitats. I mean, you know, Britain wants to protect upland Britain. Um, which is massively degraded. It's used mainly for uh, a rich people to shoot pheasants. Um, protecting more of that isn't going to do anything for Britain's biodiversity. So I, I think we've got to focus on the key, the key areas. Um, and when we do that, we do realize that um, much of that problem um, is not just a matter of creating bigger reserves. In some cases, we're not going to be able to do that but to better manage what we have. Hello, Stuart. Can you hear me? This is Susan. I can't hear you. Fine. Hello, can you hear me? 
I don't think this yes, is Yes, I can hear you. Okay. All right. Um, thank you. I really enjoyed your talk. It's very relevant for us in Australia, particularly in our state, Queensland, because we the government was expanding our state quite dramatically in the desert areas, <laughs> but not in the areas where we were losing most of our forest in the southeast with due to urban expansion. So I did have a question and um, you were discussing rates of extinction and you mentioned that we can use phylogenies to estimate the rate of new species emergence. And I guess my question was, yeah. um, Obviously, with phylogenies, we don't know what species emerged and went extinct. So how do we accommodate those unknowns? <laughs> well, um, the reason that um, Yuri DeVos was the co was the lead author on that paper that I showed is it's it's horrendous. It's a, one of the messiest, nastiest bits of statistics I've ever done. Um, the answer is you can. You can fit models that recognize that species are being born and species are going extinct. Um, and then you can uh, do a, a, a sort of a like a maximum likelihood approach that comes up with the best estimates of, of both ex natural extinction rates and natural speciation rates. Uh, but it's it's complicated. I don't even have time to give you the the outline of how to do that um and i basically not thought that it's um something that i need to go into a huge amount of detail on because one of the things we can say is that you know we're driving species to extinction a thousand times faster than they diversify and that's true now you say, well that diversification is net diversification and I agree, but it's still it's still a very interesting and very well supported uh, statistic. So um, that's that's not an answer to your question, but I hope it'll do. Okay, great, Stuart. A, a quick question: um, Given what you've talked about, do you th would you be able to identify certain places on the planet that might be sort of conservation bargains? And sort of following on Fiona's question about. Obviously, some places land prices are going to be a lot higher. Some places uh, opportunity costs are going to be higher. If you were sort of pressed or somebody came and gave you a billion dollars and said, okay, Stuart, you can go out here and where are you going to look for land for conservation? Or do you have a priority list? Yeah. Uh, and now what we do at Saving Nature. Um, the, uh, um, I found at Saving Nature when I became very disillusioned with what the big conservation organizations were doing. Um, I didn't think they were very transparent and I didn't think they were very efficient. Um, we A billion dollars would not go very far um, if um, if you just said, okay, I want to buy up big chunks of land. You know, A billion dollars won't buy you a lot of, of, uh, of Southwestern Australia, for example. But it's a huge but. You can look at what we've got. We can look at what's left. We can see um, that many of the areas that are important, many of the biodiversity hotspots, have these, the, these fragmented landscapes. Um, and you can say, well, what does it cost to create a habitat corridor? So that first example that, that, I, that I showed you from Brazil, um, um, the, the origins of that story was that I had gone to a meeting of my least favorite big conservation group um, that wanted to set conservation priorities for coastal Brazil. The meeting cost $300,000. Um, and I talked to my colleagues in Brazil and I said, look, you know, it's obvious that that isolated nature reserve, the reserve of Union, that nature reserve is going to lose its species. It's only 6,000 hectares. It's isolated. How much is it going to cost for us to buy that cattle pasture and reforest it? And the answer was $300,000. And that's how Saving Nature got, got started. So, you know, there are people out there who want to spend 
billions of dollars. A billion dollars is the annual budget of the nature conservancy. But if you spend it in the wrong place, it's not going to do you any good. And I think we can and do um, use our science and use our science well to, to, to look for the bargain, to, to reconnect fragmented places. The project that I showed you in Brazil, which cost $300,000, uh, you know, bought a couple of hundred hectares, but it's now created a continuous area of forest uh, that's from um, 28,000 hectares. So it was an enormously good bargain. And so what we do at Saving Nature is we shop for bargains and we, you know, got, I think now a dozen, a dozen bargains around the world. Very good. Is there anybody online, Penny or Noel or anyone else? Yeah, we've, I've been I've been online since before the very first answer to the questions. Um, <laughs> we seem to be getting a bit ignored here online. Uh, I do have a I do have a comment actually. Um, thanks very much, Stuart, for that. That was a, a great talk. I'm not sure whether you're familiar with what's going on in Australia in the policy environment. There's a, a major review of of Australia's um, uh, environmental legislation. And um, that hopefully will introduce the concept of actually looking at regions and having regional plans that will determine where uh, development can occur and where it cannot occur. There is another act that's just been uh, legislated and that's called the Nature Repair Act, where corporations and others can create a biodiversity certificates. And uh, I, uh, got a paper in, in press with Jaden that's looking at these things in a, in a, in a bigger way, looking at, at the carbon uh, estate. And what we think could happen is that you could actually somehow blend these two things because it's still in its formative stage to allow uh, corporations to invest in those areas that have been identified by regions, not nationally, as really important for species. And, and, um, and that might be a good example, I suppose, to show off what might be done. So you could perhaps start here. Okay. Yeah, I'm really, I, I, didn't, I didn't mention carbon in my previous answer. Uh, we fund a lot of what we're doing through carbon offsets. Um, and that's new for us, but it's it's worked out very well. They are very, very tricky to get. It's a lot of work to get them. Um, but there are we get a price of um of twenty five u s dollars per per ton of carbon dioxide. Um, and that's enough to make the restoration of uh, parts of Brazil and Colombia and um, other parts of the world, a, a, an economically very attractive option. Now, there are other parts of the world where land is much more expensive than that. Um, but you know, the, the areas where we work, the forests uh, sequester somewhere between um, you know 10 and 20 uh, tons of carbon dioxide um, per hectare per year, uh, some of them more than that. And I don't give a, 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 a big enough um, revenue stream that it's worthwhile uh, restoring native forests on them. So so there are certainly bargains out there where you can use carbon offsets to, to cover the cost of the project. Yeah, you know, that isn't going to be, be true of uh, a choice bits of real estate in Queensland. Oh, um, hi, Stuart. Um, great, great presentation again. Great to um, see all the insights and the work that you've done. Um, my, I'm sort of following on a little bit from the previous um, questions as well. Just uh, we, the um, for COP20 and and all the uh, goals in which they want to reach for the 30% or um, all these numbers that need to be thrown out there. And uh, you briefly touched on the one million species and all that sort of thing that can be pulled from a summary. Um, do we actually need something to put uh, a value on biodiversity? in a sense of if we are um, trying to reach goals um, for certain protected areas, um, a higher value, so similar to uh, a blue carbon, to a normal carbon offset, um, things that have a higher value. So instead of reaching a percentage as a single, it'll be um, the biodiversity hotspots have a higher value. Therefore, the goals can be reached um, using these different sort of ways of protecting landscapes. 
Um, uh, I, I think there's a couple of points in there. One of them is I think we have to be very careful what we ask for. Um, it's going to be very easy for for, for politicians to uh, to big chunks of land that nobody else wants. And sometimes they can be good, but often they won't be. And that's been a theme of what I said uh, said here. Um, the other thing is I think it's very difficult to get the people at the cops to to come up with statistics on biodiversity. Um, I have a paper in, in the final stages of, of preparation where we say, look, you know, can, can we measure biodiversity? Can we measure progress? Can we measure areas protected? Can we measure the, the species that we protect? And the answer is emphatically yes. I mean, that was a theme of what I said, is you can look at whether our protected areas have protected species, and they've actually done a better job than many people recognize. Um, so I think the challenge for us in the scientific community um, is to is to say, look, there are these things that uh, we can measure. There are places that we need for biodiversity and the emphasis needs to go there. And we need to get that message across. Um, and what COP15 has not done yet is to come up with a set of statistics, a set of measures other than the 30% um, that talk about those targets, they're still baffing around trying to come up with a list of targets. And I think we have to say, look, come on, you can come up with these targets. Um, I mean, Australia's commitment to no new extinctions, like I said, I have no idea what an old extinction is, um, but that's good. I mean, if Australia's gonna say, we're not gonna let species go extinct, then that's gonna shape policy um, in a much more sophisticated and useful way than just saying we're going to protect, you know, um, another 100,000 hectares of rural Queensland. Thank you very much, Stuart. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Two more questions online. Uh, Tanya? Tanya? Tanya, go ahead. Tanya? Is whoever else has another question? Go ahead. Hi. Um... So I was just curious, um, love the presentation, and uh, I was just curious, since a lot of this um, things differentiate between a terrestrial and the marine world, and there is the 30 by 30 to account for the marine, is there anything uh, slightly different or, sim or anything you pull from the terrestrial um, that could possibly apply to the marine, or do you think we need like an entirely different approach just because that is such a large space? Um, the paper I mentioned, the, that's a review article on uh, conservation, conservation effectiveness, uh, that my co-author is, is Callum Roberts at the University of Exeter, uh, a long-term colleague. I, Callum is a leading expert there is a marine story. It's remarkably similar um, in its outline to the terrestrial one. Uh, species are going extinct in marine habitats. We're protecting, uh, uh, we're not always protecting the right marine habitats to slow extinction. Um, but there are clearly measurable statistics that we can uh, we can create that will measure uh, uh, protection of the ocean. In, in more uh, uh, sensible ways than just say we want to protect 30% of it. Great. Thank um, you. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Vanya, are you continuing on here? Um, my friend, um, her computer crashed, but she also had a question here with me. She just wanted to know if there was any evidence on how effective those corridors were, be it in Brazil or other places. Um, that's that's an interesting question. I'd like to tell you that I have a huge research program that measures the effectiveness of the corridors. I don't. We have camera traps in the corridors. We know that we got some um, um, amazing uh, footage from the from the corridors. I skipped over a piece of my talk because I was running over that shows the corridor in Sumatra, where where we have tigers and orangutans and all sorts of wonderful things going through our corridors. Um, um, the reason that I don't spend a huge chunk of money on research 
is, you know, for every hundred thousand dollars worth of research I spend money on, you know, I can build another corridor. Um, so we are taking the effectiveness of the corridors for granted. I'm fully aware with the of the criticisms of that, but given the awful choice that we only have a limited budget, um, I'd rather spend the budget on building more corridors. Uh, and assuming that they will work. I think there's a very, very strong presumption that this will work. We know species use them. What we don't have is measures of how the corridors reduce extinction rates. To do that would require a massive research effort. And as I said, I'd rather spend the money on building more corridors. Stuart, a question from Brisbane. Sean Foley, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Bill. Um, one of our mutual colleagues, Earl Saxon, um, has been looking at these tricky questions from the perspective of how do we choose conservation areas that take climate change into account? That's the short yeah. story. I'm sure you've thought about it quite a bit. We have. Um, and um, uh, what I didn't uh, mention in the um, in the presentation is the corridors that I showed you build that in. They are corridors that connect lowlands to uplands or relative lowland to relatively up upland. The only thing we can do is to give species the opportunity to move. Um, and, and corridors do that, you know, that's what corridors do. They connect things so species can move, but to the extent that we can, we make sure that species can move up slope. So all the projects we have, the projects that we have in the project we have in Sumatra, the ones in uh, in Colombia, in Brazil, make that movement possible. It's the only thing we can do. I mean, yes, um, we're offsetting carbon. Uh, we're we're offsetting a, a significant amount of carbon with our tree planting activities. Um, but but the solution obviously is to transition to. Uh, an efficient um, energy supply. But what we ecologists can do is make sure that species can move upslope as the climate warms, and we do that. Okay, are there any other questions, either online or in the room here? We have almost 50 people today, which is a good total altogether, and lots of questions, Stuart, which I think is reflective of the fact that the stuff you're talking about is a lot really interesting. Well, look, uh, without further ado, then, thanks, Stuart, because Stuart is unquestionably one of the most important conservation scientists and thinkers in the world today. And we really are lucky to have him here with us at JCU today. And we hope we can get him here in person before too long. Without any further ado, let's please thank Stuart. Thank you very much. Bye bye.